yeah, so those are kind of really two two important things that I want the Ellen and family to know, as well as that part about being an optimist. Uh, that has really driven me for the last four or five years. Probably got me to the point where I'm willing to put it out there on a podcast because mm. you have to do that with some optimism, uh, thinking, hey, I'm just putting this out here. You know, and if one person listens to me, and that's that's been uh, kind of the drive of my last four or five years of my career is how can I help people? How can I help this next generation? How can I give them stuff? I just want to share. I want to help people. So that's that's what it comes down to. And if if it's one person, that I'm fine with that. I'm I'm good mm -hmm. if there's one listener and it's my brother. As long as you can help one person at a time, that's the best thing that you can do in life. Oh, yeah. That's my buddy, Mr. James Gable, full of optimism and really out there working to make a difference in terms of communication. Y'all got to check out his podcast, uh, The Uncommon Communicator. They're currently dissecting the book Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, which is a pretty darn good book. If you haven't checked it out yet, check it out. I just want to give you some insight as to how humble and, and awesome James is. He reached out to me kind of out of the blue. We had met way back in the day on a teleconference. And he reached out saying, hey, man, I'd like to get some time with you to talk about podcast stuff. And so we had a really great time talking over an hour. And I had a last minute situation come up that I really needed some help with. And I reached out to James like a day later and I'm like, hey, bro, are you available? Because I got an opening and, and I'd love to celebrate you. And, and man, he jumped right on it. So James, thank you, bro. People need to know that, that James's mission is to help the next generation gain the skills needed to navigate and facilitate any conversation to mutual understanding. And he came to this through decades of experience in the industry and, and growing uh, growing his career as foreman, general foreman, now he's general contractor. And in this conversation, he and I start talking about the toughest role in construction, which he and I both agree that that is the foreman role. I've been a foreman. I still rem I still have scars from living through all that less than wonderfulness, but it was an important time for me to grow and develop as an individual. Uh, and you know, it's woven throughout the conversation, but James really is focused on helping people understand why soft skills like communication are important for team members in construction. You know, we like to call them soft skills, but they're really like power skills, the ability to listen with the intent to understand and the ability to communicate our thoughts and ideas in such a way that people can visualize them is a powerful skill uh, and, and maybe underinvested in. Also want to give y'all a heads up that we have some, to quote Mr. Steve Turner, wicked cool ideas in the oven right now. Keep an eye out the week of January 12th. Uh, we're going to be live streaming with some teachers at a technical school. I hope to see y'all there. Shout out to all of the our patrons that have been supporting this podcast. Uh, you all have contributed heavily to the mm, increased quality of the visuals and some of the audio stuff. And for the rest of y'all, keep listening. We love y'all. And here we go. So here we are with Mr. James Gable. Communication expert. <laughs> no, not, not, not in the job description. <laughs> I love it, man. Um, so LM family want to introduce you to Mr. James. He just launched his podcast. Was it December 1st? December 1st. Yes, sir. The the uncommon communicator. That's right. Uh, I, I got to listen. Man, I, I've said it the other day when we talked. I'm gonna say it again. The music selection. <laughs> of the intro is like the coolest like I knew every single reference I'm like okay I don't know if I'm hip or we're just kind of from the same generation but this is perfect <laughs> it was great. And that is that's all my co-host that he is a communications major he studied uh, this stuff he's into the music if you if I put my music in there you would we wouldn't be talking about it uh, <laughs> but he, it's all him and yeah he did a great job on that yeah Yes. And the two of you, I'll tell you this, I listened to both the episodes this morning. 
um, 22, 23 minutes long. So, you know, it's a manageable amount of time. Um, the, the dynamic between the two of you, there's the, you know, the, the, he's referencing Pokemon I know. <laughs> and you're not talking about Pokemon, and, but it's, it's like, that's the realness of it, right? Like sure. the generational difference, the, but still being able to communicate on a shared idea. Uh, right. and I think, I think that's, that's, what's kind of standing out to me is the, the band of age groups that you can connect with the two of you can connect with and serve um right. uh i'm really excited to see what you do with them and so how you doing mr james i'm doing good hey thanks for inviting me to the palatial studios of the <laughs> learning and missteps uh it's an honor to be here uh glad we found the time to do this yeah man it's a it is a crazy path so you and i met uh as a result of a LCI COP for Denver, the Denver COP, Lean Construction Institute, um, I was co-facilitating a conversation on gimbal walks with Jorge Rincon. Shout out to Jorge. Jorge. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know this, James, but he was the lean manager for Dallas, and now he is the regional lean manager for the central region there. Oh, so is he, he be Jesse? Is that what he is? <laughs> he's going to be... <laughs> <laughs> way way better than than what i was but yeah he he backfilled the spot that i was in and and he's going to take him to all new heights man he's a he's a solid dude well it's fun to see just how different connections happen right that was a five dollar one hour gimbal walk class that i went to it might have been two hours five bucks like are you guys making money off of that i don't mm -hmm. think so like you probably could have gave me five bucks i would have went but it was neat to go to that and then i had a couple of my young guys uh project engineers i paid their five bucks for them too i didn't yeah. even it's too much work to put it on the company card like you guys <laughs> need to come to this too and we sat in that thing and that's you know that gets that start of our we're definitely lean amateurs lean apprentices you know we're first year apprentices at trying to figure out lean but that was one thing that you know that was just that first connection you know where yeah. you where you meet Jorge, you meet, uh, hey, you know, me, you, Jesse. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's just kind of funny how all that stuff rolls around. Yeah, it's it's an amazing world and the social media space, the um, podcasting and um, live streaming and videos and like it has a profound effect on people. And and you know, one of the things I appreciate about appreciate about you, James, is your positive message and the way you carry yourself the way you show up it's clear to me that you're um you care about people about investing in people uh and there's you know we've all heard the language influencers um and there are a lot of influence there's so many influencers out there whether you it's almost like whether you want to or not you are an influencer uh you remember charles barkley back in the day where there was all the media commotion that he, everybody was saying he's a, a role model and he needs it. And he's like, I'm not a role model, <laughs> you know, and I kind of felt like I feel him, but at the same time, I said, yeah, but, but you kind of are right. We've got to own the impact that we have on people. And, and I'm like, again, I'm going to say it again. So pleased to hear your podcast. You're out there sharing, sharing your voice, your thoughts, your message. And you're one of the influencers that I want to be associated with. Um, and, and so I want to give you the uncomfortable opportunity to brag about yourself, James. So <laughs> what should the l &M family know about you, sir? Yeah, and I know you asked that. That's, that is tough. And <laughs> you know, when you become a general, I, and I, a part of my story, and I'll share that, you know, when we mm -hmm. uh, want to talk about my career path, but, you get into the world of, uh, I went to the dark side of general contracting <laughs> and I was a industrial contractor, subcontractor for most of my life. I'm a millwright by trade. Nice. I went to the millwright apprenticeship. My dad's a millwright. My grandpa was a millwright at General Motors. My three brothers are all millwrights. So this is, we're a wow. construction family. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, some of us aren't all wearing blue collars anymore either, but we're, my, my brother is a regional manager of the International Brotherhood of Carpenters. So he's over okay. several locals, regions. That's a recent promotion for him. And just this has been in our family. It's in our family. That's who we are. Yep. But I, I want L&M family to know 
is, a, is several things. And you brought it up. Optimist. Those are the one of the things that I think I promote a lot now. I am an optimist. I'm mm-hmm. not if I'm not just a glass half full, uh, but if that glass is a quarter full, then there's 75 percent more opportunity in that glass. That's that's the attitude that I take into problem solving and to just who I am and and how I am. So that's kind of a key thing. I'm a family man. I, I've everything I've done in my career has been for my family and I've done it in my own way, which is how we learned to do it. You know, I've and, and when I say that, I've spent a lot, I've worked a lot of overtime. My my last or my first 11 years, I worked 2,600 hours a year. I worked mm. every bit of overtime that I could work because I was a sole supporter of my family. We found it important that my wife was home with the kids and that that's, you know, we ate a lot of mac and cheese and I worked a ton of overtime. And that's, yep. that's what I felt like I did for my family. I worked out of town a couple of times again to support the family, but not home. And I say that that's, I am a family man, but I also I, I think I coach people differently now when mm-hmm. when they are thinking about their family, uh, I, I you can't get that time back. You know, that's mm-hmm. things that I know and have learned. I still feel like I did it for the family, but there are things that you can never get back. And you, what's one you get one day at a time and you don't get that other day back, you know, and you've got mm-hmm. one more ahead of you if you're lucky. And that's how you really have to look at. That's how I look at life in regards to that. But I did what I could for my family. I love my family. So absolutely family guy. I love to cook. You know, if we're talking nice. things besides that, I've got a really a highly popular Instagram. I mean, it's huge. I'm big on Instagram. Okay. Uh, Sometimes, and I cook a lot of things. I'll post pictures. I get seven, eight likes. You know, I just get, there's a lot of people out there that <laughs> like the pictures that I share. Uh, one or two, I don't even know. No, I, I do have a couple of people that uh, like to look at the things that I, I love cooking. Uh, and uh, yeah, so those are kind of really two two important things that I want the Ellen and family to know, as well as that part about being an optimist. Uh, that has really driven me for the last four or five years. Probably got me to the point where I'm willing to put it out there on a podcast because mm. you have to do that with some optimism, uh, thinking, hey, I'm just putting this out here. you know. And if one person listens to me, and that's that's been uh, kind of the drive of my last four or five years of my career is how can I help people how can i help this next generation how can i give them stuff and by giving them stuff i want them to have it in i i want them to get i just want to share i want to help people so that's that's what it comes down to and if if it's one person that i'm fine with that i'm i'm good mm-hmm. if there's one listener and it's my brother because mm-hmm. <laughs> i don't care that that's as long as you can help one person at a time that's the best thing that you can do in life you got it, man. We can change the world one world at a time. Uh, man, I applaud your courage there because, it, you know, you and I are fellow podcasters. It's it's a right. little scary. You know, you want everybody to love you. But you know what? Realistic. Let's get let's set some realistic goals. And if it impacts one person, it's totally worth it. So here. So you're on James dot Gable dot nine eight four on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's nine hundred and eighty. Three <laughs> people apparently. I put no thought. I'm like, I'm not going to do Instagram. I'll never do anything in there. And yeah. Yep. Yep. So I looked at it. It says future influencer. <laughs> You're there already. So that may need an update. But I'm looking at this scrumptious. Oh, yeah. That's a griddle cake right there. Griddle. What is that? Tell us, please. Man. So I got a Blackstone. I can't tell you how many months ago that I got. And that Blackstone, you know, it's a, it's a griddle. You know, it's like a four burner griddle and I cooked 12 days in a row on that thing. When I got it and put it together on Saturday, I cooked all three meals on Sunday on that thing. This thing's a, it's the ultimate cooking machine, but you take a biscuit, you put a little bit of butter down, you put some, uh, I rolled it in cinnamon and sugar, and then you just put it on that thing and just, it gets this caramely crispy biscuit full of, you know, diabetes (laughs) and whatever you want to get. Yes. Yes. But yeah, that's a griddle cake. I do. It's funny. Uh, and you know, you talk, you, you, you always want uh, feedback, right? And so I've, uh, and it's not always going to be positive. I did these really good looking and you can please follow me on Instagram. Be, be number nine or 10 that likes that uh, picture <laughs> that I put in there. But that, 
uh, I did some crispy tacos, I called them. So it's cheese and meat. And then I folded them over, put a little bit of oil on it, got the outside of that tortilla really crispy, made crispy tacos. And then I had several comments that would not tacos. Oh. It's a quesadilla. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. really? The critics. How much more do you, there, there's only three or four ingredients in any of those ones that you're talking about. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, man, the uh, taco aficionados out there are, are bad. You know what? You should put a poll on LinkedIn. It's a d- description, taco, yes or no. People are going crazy for polls on LinkedIn. Um, and and I'm going to say it qualifies as a taco. And I'm from San Antonio. Where, like, well, we're, you're the taco. We're the oh, taco God. kings, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Austin likes to argue that, but they're just confused. It's San that'll, be a, that'll be a tough pull because if anybody says no to taco, they mm-hmm. might to unfriend me. <laughs> you can eat them for breakfast. You can eat them for lunch. You can eat them for dinner. I make breakfast tacos. My daughter works at Starbucks, and I'll make... Uh, burritos for them breakfast burritos bring it into their to their crew oh, and nice. w- then once i got the griddle i started making breakfast tacos and bringing them in and uh, that's the ultimate it's the ultimate vehicle for yeah. eating food I, I, you very well said the ultimate vehicle you don't need any utensils just get the thing and put it in your face like deliciousness <laughs> easy access 100 <laughs> percent so James, you know what stands what's kind of standing out to me is you you're just very personable, super cool, low key, relaxed. I'm wondering and you're you're in the general contractor space, you have significant responsibility there. And you know, I've been in the industry since 95 and people with your demeanor are like very very few and far between. Uh and so it makes me wonder, like, do you have a switch when you go to work where you got to <laughs> amp it up or how do you or do you maintain this this type of easygoing, um, relatable demeanor? I, I would I would say now I'm probably the same. OK, but that's a great question, because I when when raising my kids, they I kept work at work. So I'd come home when it came time to come home. And I tell you, you're not a man if you don't paint paint your daughter's fingernails, mm, you know, play Barbies yes. with her. She had littlest pet shops. That's that was her thing. And we played when we got home. My son had Legos. We play Legos when we got home. I didn't talk about work when I got my daughter didn't know what I did. She knew places I worked. I worked mm-hmm. at Jolly Rancher. She thought I worked at Jolly Rancher. No, of I was putting scenery there. I worked at Coors for a long time. Different places I've worked. She just associated, hey, dad made candy. I mean, she had no idea. Right. And that was by purpose. I didn't come home. I didn't want to bore my wife with work stuff. She knows what I do probably more than a lot of other wives as far as some interactions and stuff. But sure. I don't sit. I don't complain about work. You know, this is not my place. This is my safe place. So I never really talked about work at home and I had the, when she was in high school I had a great opportunity to, to get her to school before I went to Coors because they're really wow. close together so I could drop her off she would get up early and get to uh, school an hour early just so she could ride dad could give her a ride neat time and mm-hmm. sometimes as the, you know time was pushing my phone would ring I, I'm like hey, I got to take this phone call when I'm dropping her off and she pointed out that's like that's worker dad voice like suddenly <laughs> my voice changed <laughs> and so to answer your question yeah absolutely I was I I have that a little bit different demeanor but I mean who I am is who I am I think that's always how it is but there I definitely have a different home uh James and there is the work James uh for sure that's kind of the way you got to go, but I don't imagine it's like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde transition. I, I am I am who I am, and I think I am different in what you're talking about as far as being, I'm a general superintendent for Adolphson and Peterson. They're a billion dollar general contractor. We're in you know, several cities. We're the largest region here in Colorado. You know, we're a, we're a big company now as a general soup. I'm, I'm over our itsy bitsy baby, tiny, you know, small projects, 10 million and under is what we shoot for you know just the tiny stuff but we, it's the small projects team and that's that in it in its own has really helped me be who i am over the last four or five years as well too i've been with the company because it's we're, we're an entrepreneur within a big gigantic company we started a company with the backing of a billion dollar company Ooh, and yeah. started with uh i was the second superintendent hired we're the first one uh couldn't he, he was good mm-hmm. but he 
he couldn't do schedules. Uh, I actually asked him, hey, can you do a schedule? He goes, of course. He wrote it out on paper. I'm like, can you right. use the software stuff? And yeah, he yeah. could not. He had he didn't have that ability, but he was a good superintendent. Ended up not working out. So I was really the second superintendent that got hired. And funny yeah. story with that. Uh, and I'm sure we use projects, Microsoft projects. Okay. When I was interviewed, they're like, hey, we did a lot of it schedule driven. You know, how are you with schedules? Well, I can I can put a schedule together. Do you use projects? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I hey, open up my brand new computer and it's like 2016 Microsoft projects. Mm. My company had been sharing a disk since 2003 was the version that I had used before. A lot of buttons got added between 2003 and 2006. Oh, yeah. So I YouTubed it, figured it out, and you know, there's just more buttons to push. But poor Fred could not uh, get the computer stuff down. So yeah. he didn't work yeah. out. So we started small. Hang a picture on the wall is kind of what we're we're saying we're going to do. And a lot of people don't expect a, a GC to take those small projects on. Our yeah. goal was to take uh, existing clients and support them because a lot of times big projects, they move on and they're like, hey, we still want AP here. We want yep. you guys here. And we didn't have a vehicle for doing that. We're like, oh, we got to move on and go build another big building. Right. Uh, it wasn't done with that attitude. But um, it, it was... Uh, really a niche that we started with. And we also wanted to bring in new clients, which we have. So we really have had some kind of skyrocketing growth over the last four or five years. And that has been that entrepreneur. At, at one point when we're thinking, what are we going to do next? We talked about Trash Kings. Like we had a job site up north. It's a $200 million job site. There's going to be a lot of dumpsters up there. Oh, yeah. So why couldn't we as a company find a way to, you know, save money on the job and make money on the job? Right. So there's just a lot of that entrepreneurial type thing, thoughts, patterns with my boss. He is definitely a dreamer. He likes to think about what's next. Let's not do it the same way. And that's why he's been a driver for lean within our company mm -hmm. or within our group, because he, we're tired of doing it the same way. Yeah. And we have been. And that's just the, the thing that. I've picked up on lean, you know, we've been, uh, lean construction has been around for like 29 years now, something yep. like that. Uh, prior to that, it goes back to what, 1950 something with the Toyota, yep. Toyota way. And, and how did that apply to construction? But for almost 30 years, we've been doing construction. You look how manufacturing changed in the same time frame, and we're still just now getting there, you know, and oh, some yeah. of the other podcasts I listen, I think Felipe had a podcast that shout out to Felipe. Yeah. <laughs> There, he had a podcast uh, about some innovators on prefabrication. You know, we I hear about those things. We're 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 working with some trade partners that are doing it, but we're still doing it the same way. I'm still putting, uh, uh, putting sheetrock and and steel studs up the same way that we did it. You know, mm -hmm. 15, 20 years ago, and it's time consuming and it's wasteful. You know, and how do we do that in a in a you know tenant improvement area? We're just we're in that. Uh, I think we got a long way to go. And the people that are innovating and doing it are building different things than what I'm building right now, which is TIs. How can we do TIs different? So those are things that he's he's an innovator in, in making us think, how can we do it different? Because we're tired of doing it the same way. Oh, and that is, it sounds like you're in a very nurturing environment. Um, and, you know, you spent, you described that you spent many years as a millwright, went through the apprenticeship and worked your way into now the dark side of general contracting. <laughs> Um, how, so now you have a, a, a boss that is a leader that supports experimentation because sometimes those experiments don't work out, right? It, That's it, true. Yeah, but you learn from them. Some. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> is it so? yeah, you have a bunch of them. If you're out there doing lean stuff, you have a bunch of stuff that just like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and that's okay because you learn from that. Right. Um, but through your career, how many bosses, like what's the ratio of bosses that you've had that were like nurturing and breathed life into you versus those that like sucked the life out of you? Well, and I, that's a good question. I hadn't, you surprised me with that one. <laughs> uh, I, I would say Joe by far has been the most nurturing boss. Okay. He he has allowed me, I came in as a superintendent, you know, coming from industrial into general construction with really no general construction, uh, in for, you know, no general instruction. You know, I didn't, I didn't know how to, I take it back. I came in with the knowledge of general construction, but not to the level of commercial construction. 
Got it. So, you know, I'm, I was a newbie, but I had, he, I felt like I had good people skills and I, I'm a quick learner. I can read drawings. You know, those were the things that, uh, and this might offend some people, but when you set precision equipment to a thousandth of an inch, mm -hmm. uh, I moved some rocket equipment and that was, uh, I worked at ULA or for ULA with ULA. Then we relocated them from Colorado down to Decatur, Alabama. It was mm. another job that I spent out of town. You, you said precision equipment when you're mechanically minded, and that's yep. why I love about the trades. You're a problem solver, and I thought this is just a different problem to solve. I'll take it on and, and I'll learn it. Looking back, I, you know, I've I've been doing this over thirty years, and you, if anyone knows, thirty years ago, the nurturing boss. If you said that word, uh, you know, you were you were kicked off the job. You know. And there was not, so nurturing was, and this is really, and actually this is a great question because I, how I operate, I try to be different than how I was necessarily raised. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that, I have, I don't need the pats on the back. Mm -hmm. So because for me, the best, the most, one of the most least nurturing guys that I worked for, I learned a bunch from this guy. And this is a guy here in Colorado. He never said attaboys. If he said nothing on my job, if he walked on my superintendent and, and looked around, didn't say anything, all right, I got to go. It looks like you got it covered. That was the attaboy. That was it. So yep. I don't, I, I'm I'm getting better at giving those out. You know, mm. I, I'm recognizing people's achievement because people want that and they need that. I, for me, I didn't need that. And so I had a hard time giving that out. So when you say nurturing, nurturing was when they didn't, you know, berate you or say, tell everything that you did wrong, which right. is hard to do when you're a superintendent and you've got, you got to take, and he taught me a lot. You, you go and you have, you have to take a snapshot of a job and you got to go to the next one and look at the next job that's going on. You've got a few minutes to make an assessment. So he taught me how to do that. I can go in, but what am I assessing? If you fix that, that's going to be better. You, this is not working over here. You need to do this over here because you're thinking you're helping guide that guy to a better job site yep. by giving him all the negative. But that's not supporting him personally right. in his goal. And so that that's something I've really wrestled with over the course of my career because for the most part, not very, to answer your question, not very many what you would call nurturing. No. Uh, we didn't, I didn't even know that word. Uh, you know, <laughs> just not getting yelled at that's nurturing right and, and we're a different world now we can't we're not yellers uh, i think yeah. there still are some uh, but there's some that are hard line superintendents that that's it's their way or the highway and guess what they're getting jobs done and they and i also found that people want some level of assertive leadership too and that's what i've really loved doing they want clear direction they don't yes. want to what do you think what do you think about that they don't want that we want boundaries you know people what do you want me to do boss you know mm -hmm. that's what that's the mindset of you know of me as a construction worker is what do you want and i'll go do it i'll do whatever you want yep tell me I, i'm with you man i love it when somebody says hey let's go have dinner I'm like okay good and they say meet me here at 7 p.m yes done yeah and it's like well you know, like you know what? I got a pizza in the fridge. <laughs> I'll save me some time. That's um, ah, that's key, right? That that has that happens a lot. You know, yeah. where do you want to go? What do you like? And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's a. I never thought of that as a key of leadership. I need to pick more places to. I have plenty of places to eat. If you come out here, you won't have to choose. Ten How's four. That? Yeah, just be. <laughs> let's meet here at this time. Boom, done. Let's go. Uh, gets the ball rolling, and decision making is down. It, I mean, it's beautiful. There's two key things that you that stood out to me when you were speaking. One was your experience as a millwright and and the problem solving capability that you have developed as a result of doing that work, and and how it's transcended into a major leadership role where you're kind of inventing, creating a new business within the business. And so I wanted to highlight that for, you know, the L&M moms and dads out there with, that have younglings in school, that, you know, to help them understand it, our industry, craft workers, trades folks, industrial arts, all of the above, creates this capability that is pretty darn profound. It's not as shiny as some of the other careers out there, which is, you know, we're working on that. Um, 
but it it provides immense value. I mean, there's there I you know I've got personal friends that they'll need help and I'll go help them out and and they're like, man, how many times have you done that? I was like, oh, this is my first time. <laughs> and they're like, what? <laughs> like you just kind of and it's hard for me to like articulate, right? Because you just like this podcasting thing. Shout out to Miss Stephanie Brown. She's she's poured a lot of positivity into me in 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 the way that I show up on social media. And it's I just tinker around and click on this and look at that. And if I need some you know extra examples, I'll go to YouTube um, and or reach out to my contacts and say, hey, how do you do this? But it really is that kind of mindset or that ability to to j let's just play around with it, figure things out and produce something that that is um, digestible or suits somebody else's need, provides value to others. Right. Uh, yeah, the other thing you talked about was the fact that you're the person that you're with, it, it, your uh, boss, he's, he's a nurturing innovator, um, and you leaning into that. It was kind of un the undertone where, you know, perfectionism can be paralyzing or, or the fear of failure can be paralyzing. And in order to innovate and grow and, and really leverage the the brain power and the spirit that we have in ourselves, we've got to be courageous and like just you're gonna get dirty, like it's and it's gonna be okay. <laughs> you, you you can rinse yourself off. It's not a big deal. Uh, now, on the other side of that is for leaders out there because we got a bunch of leaders and we got a bunch of aspiring leaders out there. Uh, if if you're not it may be valuable to go and ask your people if they feel supported. Yeah, that's uh, a good question. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and that's, I would say I, I found my groove with yes. where I'm at right now. At, at 50 years old, I found what I wanted to do. I say this a lot, you know, for a lot of years, I did what I had to do. I had a family. I, I did jobs that I didn't like doing. I, I didn't like going into work. Sometimes they're tough and you do it because you have to do it. Now I'm doing because I want to do it, which is a different mindset for me because I feel like who made me was doing all of that stuff that I had to do. And now I'm saying at the 23 years old, go do what you want to do. Well, going and doing what you're going to do might not mean working here. And that's that's tough for me to say that. And so let me let me back up a little bit and talk about how I got in the trades. Yes, because please. If you would think, you know, I mentioned my whole family's in it, right? You'd think it was a natural given, hey, you're going to go be a millwright. Well, it wasn't. And I was the fourth. I have three older brothers, and I was the smart one. Uh, that's what one of them calls me anyways. But they all got into the millwrights. They got into the trades. I was going to be a music major. I had ah. spent three quarters at a community college, uh, just mired in doing nothing at a community college, wanting to be a music major. And my dad came to me and he said, hey, son, why don't you just take the quarter off, take the summer off, earn some money, then go ahead and go back to school. You know, get in, work a little bit, earn some money. That yeah, was yeah. like 34 years ago. So <laughs> I had never wow. been back to college from then. But, you know, at, in 88, I was making 10 bucks an hour. That was great. That's money. big money. <laughs> big money. Living at home with mom and dad and making 10 bucks an hour. I mean, that was oh, great yeah. money. And then from there, as an assembler, I went into the apprenticeship. And then the apprenticeship, you know, it was always that, hey, finish the apprenticeship, then go back to college. And then after that, it was, man, I'm making great. Now I got a family to yeah. support. You know, I can't go to college supporting a family. And so I never had that degree. Um, I never had the degree. And but my degree was that apprenticeship and that apprenticeship is as good as as I think any yes. if not better any degree that you can get you get out of it what you put into it and I got a lot out of that apprenticeship uh, time and so I've been able to use that and I transferred that when I came out here to Colorado that's the best part about being in the trades too you come out here I I had signed up at the union you I knew people like I didn't yeah. but I did. You know, I had a skill set that was marketable because they had taught me how to do it. And I came out here and I worked for uh, one company for 18 years here in Colorado until mm -hmm. they had went through some uh, issues and they ended up getting sold to, to a different company. And but 18 years prior to that, though, I worked 12 years, my first company, my first year in the trade. I worked 11 companies my next year in the trade. 
and then a little bit less the next couple of years as an apprentice. And then as a journeyman, I was working between two or three different companies. I've worked for a lot of companies. Mm. And that's the experience I think that made me who I was because I was so diverse. Now the issue I have is, and, and then I worked for 18 years for the one, I would have retired there. If that was the case, I would have just retired there. Things didn't work out that way. Now I'm with a different company and it couldn't be better for me personally because it's just I've hit that groove of stuff that I love to do but it's tough for me now to coach people to uh to get the same experience that I got now it was a hard road like for me to be where I'm at there's kids right now with their with their construction management degree that are going to be superintendents in five six years seven years oh, yeah. maybe depends you know it took me 30 years to get there or 20 years to get there because it's that experience and that so there is value in general contracting with that degree to be a superintendent but how many times and i, and I wonder how many times you think about did you want to just go back to work oh. uh, <laughs> and then leave it at work you know even being a foreman level you just wish that you could I, I, my when we were when we were in jacksonville for that project that was a, probably the t- one of the toughest jobs i've ever worked we me and my boss were both like man, I just want to work at Starbucks. I just yeah. want to pour coffee and go home at the end of the day. But, you know, there's, there's, yeah, you just wish you could go back to doing that, but you don't, you know, I knew right, that as right. an apprentice, you know, one, as part of my career development too, as an apprentice, I knew I wanted to be the lead apprentice. You know, if we were, had to go talk to the boss, I wanted to make sure that I was getting the work lined up for me and my partner, which yep. I worked for a lot of companies that were apprentices with apprentices because we're cheap. So if you could just do your job and follow directions, then then you could do that. And then from there, you know, I became a foreman and being yep. a foreman. So back to being an apprentice, when I was an apprentice, I wanted to be the best apprentice that I could be. Yes. I never had any aspirations more than that. I knew I wanted to eventually be a foreman. You know, those are just the levels at 23 years old. I'm, I'll be a foreman the rest of my life. And then you see general foreman, hit that general foreman when I came out here to Colorado. Uh, still not really thinking about superintendent. I had a superintendent who, uh, he was on the five-year plan. He's on it for mm-hmm. 15 years now. Okay. Uh, five years, he was going to retire and hand over the keys. <laughs> yep. This and is my last on one. Year. <laughs> So he was kind of coaching me, training me. He ended up moving on and then I ended up taking over the superintendent job from him. He went somewhere else and gave that same speech to someone else and then went to another company. And now he's still, I think he's down to two or three years now, 15 years yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. But I never thought, okay, well, when I hit superintendent, my first year being evaluated by my project manager was, he goes, what's your five-year plan mm. my, to be a superintendent for, you know, five more years. I mean, that's, I had never even thought about that next level. I just wanted to be the best that I could be at that level. And then you realize that really in construction, I ended up being a project manager, which in my company, that was the promotion up early here, this and now with, you know, in general construction, where it's just a true partnership. You know, the the superintendent for my company is the man. And that's what drew me to being Mm -hmm. in general construction. In fact, I had met with a superintendent uh, at another, one of my coworkers had went to work for this company and he brought me over. So I'm like, how is it? What's it like? He's like, let me figure it out first. You know, I don't know how it is. (laughs) I'm like, it looks like you're having a great time. So when I, I, he said, come meet Brian. And I met Brian on a project and he's a superintendent and I'm trying to decide, do I want to be a PM or be a superintendent? And that's when I decided, you know, I really do want to be a superintendent because that superintendent runs the whole job and the PM, you know, they work on the financial side. So I made that decision, you know, four or five years ago. This is be my path and never thought much more than that. Hey, I'll be a superintendent and a general contractor. I didn't know at the time about the small projects group you know right. we had started so i'm like i'll go build buildings that sounds great you know and from there we grew we grew so fast that i just one was supporting the teams you know we had got a bunch of work over the summer a bunch of summer schools as super subs that's been wow. our first market as a gigantic general contractor we were working for our trade partners uh doing their mm-hmm. uh concrete work doing their grids ceilings floor protection stuff like that supporting them and so that in that supporting role as a small projects group 
uh, we had we just had a bunch of work. So I'm helping manage those jobs. I'm on this is I love doing this. Had several. We started hiring superintendents, and as that started to grow, it helped me grow into my position as general superintendent over all of our other superintendents. So it just all kind of happened naturally. Uh, it wasn't something I didn't think when I was 23, I'm going to be a general superintendent of a gigantic company. I didn't think that way. And I think that's important to think about in your career. We, I think a lot of people think so far ahead that they don't focus on being great at what they're doing right now. You mm -hmm. know, be the best that you can be right now. And from that, good things are going to come. 100 percent and focus on serving people and building your knowledge it's like perpetual energy just keeps building and building and it the next step the next level the next experience the next adventure reveals itself as you're going yes. down that path you know one you mentioned foreman and we gotta show love to foreman mm -hmm. uh it's you and i have a similar path right i was like yeah i just want to beat all my every apprentice i just want to smoke them <laughs> and then, right then when I got to journeyman, I just want to smoke all the journeymen. Um, and then when I got to foreman, I mean, to date, I've had very different roles and very significant transitions. To date, I still believe that foreman role is the toughest position on any job site. It, I mean, part of what happens is for me, and I get, I see it a lot in, in foreman when they get into the role is, I've spent the past five, maybe 10 years being recognized and rewarded for the amount of work that I would put out, the visible work that I would put in place. And now I'm in this new stupid role that I have to fill out paperwork and I got to go to meetings and, and now I got to use an iPad or a laptop, you know, the way things are evolving. And I can't see my work anymore because my work is no longer this tangible, visible thing. Uh, and that was very, that was a big challenge. So there's this shift in thinking that I had to make, plus the additional responsibility of doing all the company stuff. And then, you know what? Now I'm also responsible for developing people and guiding people. And like you said, providing clear direction. <laughs> 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 like <laughs> it, and Nobody says, oh, you're a first year foreman, so we're going to take it easy on you. The expectations of a foreman is that you're a 25 year seasoned freaking foreman that's an expert at everything. Yeah, like, you need to know everything. You it's got the assumption, it. right? That's the assumption. Mm -hmm. And so the pressures all the way around, right? The project manager, internal project manager, internal superintendent, the team that you're leading, the general contractor on site, the schedule, the budget, and you're learning, it's a son of a gun. And so, and, oh, and we want you to do that for a buck more an hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Compensation is, 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 there are some organizations that I've worked with and that I know that do a fabulous job of appropriately uh, appreciating their foreman. But by and large, they are an underappreciated role. So, love to all you foremen out there and everybody else, do better. Do better by your foreman. <laughs> <laughs> so, man, you've got much experience, tons of experience. And I, I imagine through all those years of, of learning and, and coming up through the, as a male right and, and coming into leadership, starting a new uh, entrepreneurial uh, business, starting a podcast. I imagine there's a bunch of learnings and missteps you've had along the way. So <laughs> I'm wondering... What is one, you know, what's a significant learning you've had as, as a result of like a painful, maybe even embarrassing misstep? Yeah, I've got, um, you know, I know you asked this question and this, this mm -hmm. it's tough for everybody to pick one, right? <laughs> I will say this, and I, I have spent a good part of my career learning from other people and I need to, everybody needs to know that you don't have to make the mistakes. And that's what I love about this aspect of your show is let's talk about them. So mm -hmm. I can know that, man, he goofed up big time. I'm not going to do that. And I spent a lot of my career watching foreman screw up to be a better foreman, yes. but not saying that I haven't. And there's a couple that really stick out for me. And, I, and one is on a, on a interpersonal level. Uh, I had an apprentice who. Yeah, it's me again, interrupting the flow of the show. 
And I'm doing this just to motiv- set the hook a little bit and motivate you to sign up and become a patron of, of our podcast so you can become a contributor in keeping us commercial free. Y'all giving us your time and listening to this episode is extremely meaningful. Uh, if you don't have the resources, completely understand you're giving us the most precious resource of all, which is your time and attention. But if you want to give a little bit more, hit us up, patreon.com slash learnings and missteps. And I'm going to stop talking now. I wasn't purposeful like I am now in mm-hmm. mentoring and coaching people. So yeah. sometimes that just happens. But that kind of went full. So that was kind of a, a misstep that went full circle for yeah. me. Yeah. That glad that it did because and, and it also there's a lot of lessons in that too right don't yes. don't hold on to that stuff yes, I should have done yes. Earlier. i should have found them earlier and done this but it did guide how i operate uh my life because of that huge you know gut wrenching misstep in my mind that i yeah. did on a person because you can make mistakes at work and i'm going to tell you about one of those uh, but you can make construction mistakes and those can be fixed and then people talk about it right but these type of things are deeper and last longer and mean more than just putting in you know putting a wall in the wrong spot yep so my other one i gotta tell you about this one because uh, i carried this name for a long time uh we were a part of this uh this project that we moved down to uh moved ula down to decatur alabama we were setting this one piece of equipment. There's a long story behind where it ended up, but I even had it approved by their quality department. They get a little tiny stamp, they put it out. And I mean, we followed the whole quality thing and this thing was set per the parameters that we relocated it down there. They go to hook, and this was a rocket factory. They go and hook the rocket up and it's, you know, this is, I don't know, 75 foot long, you know, rocket section. Well, if you're off by that much at the beginning, 75 feet out later it was off. oh way that. off yes and it ended up being i had uh, one of the bearings was switched on it uh that anyways had some brackets in there that made it to was about an inch and seven eighths off so hmm. my nickname became missed it by that much <laughs> <laughs> oh that's i didn't deep. shake that one i i was get smart for a long time missed yeah. it I, that much and we were we were called precision industrial and oh, then it was almost precision i mean it was, <laughs> you, but i'll say this go do you think i double check those things now yeah oh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah man uh, yeah, that, that's it right it's how you know for me my two best teachers is pain and failure hmm. like when when i experience pain from the decisions that I've made, they that sticks with me. When I fail, that sticks with me. And I, I, I well, there's some that I've, I've tested out and done the same stupid thing four or five times, but there's others that really like, okay, not gonna do it again. Um, and, and you were talking about uh, the gentleman that you wrote the letter on that's another thing you know back to when we were apprentices and i wanted to be a foreman i wanted to be a superintendent i want to be a general superintendent i always thought that it got easier as i now one thing for sure it got easier on my body but not easier on my psyche because you get to a point where you've got to make decisions that impact the livelihood of other human beings Mm -hmm. and that is a burden i mean you know, I've done my share of, of uh, corrective actions, terminating people, laying people off. And even the ones that I was like, please just quit because I'm sick of you. <laughs> when I had to let them go, it was not easy. It was it was hard. I didn't feel good. I did it. it. It it's the point is there are burdens with leadership yep. and and the decisions that we make impact people's lives period yeah their do- their bottom line can they put food yeah. on the table those are tough decisions and that's i think that's a good point on my evolution as well too because being in the union we we worked a lot of outages so guys were you know i was a commodity working for my 11 mm-hmm. companies that first year uh, you, you get hired, see on the next one became my word. Hey, we'll see it because there's always one more other job. So I didn't have that uh, connection necessarily because we knew the job ended and we went somewhere else for another yes. company. 
and then you traveled around doing that. But things change when you get more in a relationship based company, which I am in now. And and I look back, we've had to let some people go and it's, it is tough, but uh, I look back and, and some of these guys are shocked. Like I, I've probably laid off over 300 guys. Mm. They're like, what? Be- mm. But it was back with the handshake. See on the next one. Yeah. But, but I've gone through that. Pr- and I said, you know what? I've been laid off. 30, 40 times myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. just part of that process, but you're right. You do get that connection when you realize, hey, I've got to let this guy go. I've never, I I still stand with the idea that I have never fired anyone. Okay. They've fired themselves. That's, you know what? That is a healthy way to look at it. Uh, Provided that, for me, provided that I did everything I could to help that person meet or close the gap and meet the expectation. It took me a long time to learn that. When I finally figured that out, it was like, okay, here we are. It's decision time. These were the things we did. These are the resources we connected to you. This was the com- the, the frank, clear communication. Yeah. And it you have indicated that you don't have any interest in keeping this job. So I'm going to let you go. And, you know, there's been several people that after the fact were like, bro, thank you for doing that. I needed that wake up call. Yeah. Yeah. Or or one one gentleman actually he was in Texas. He went to Dallas. I, I didn't terminate him, but we had a straight up conversation and he was just very clear. He's like, you know what? Like, I don't want to the, what the organization, the direction the organization is headed in. I'm not OK with it. So I need to make a decision. And, and but it was a result of having direct, clear conversation. These are the expe- these are the rules of the game. These are the expectations. And that gave him, you know, drove him to a decision and say, you know what? I don't want to play this game. And guess what? That's okay. Because you don't have to play the game where you're at. You can go find another game to play and be happier. And Mm -hmm. that's what he found. So it's not easy, but but we have to do it. Our company motto is we build people. We build trust communities and people. Uh, We as a small projects group have used that we build people before the company took it on and added it in one of their three fancy sayings. But we build people has always been our thought. And at one point I had as the first guy I let go now in a different environment where I'm hiring people and building their careers versus a commodity through the union. Right. And by doing that, it was and I had to stick with this is for me to build him properly he needed to go to the next contractor Mm -hmm. that's he could he couldn't show up to work he was late he was and there's just all these issues that we tried to address and and i'm i'm the (laughs) you're not going to interview my boss are you no Um, he's (laughs) he's the you know i am the mr too many chances yeah i want to make sure like it's like i told that guy well how did you tell him you know how did you have this conversation how did you develop them you know let me have that conversation especially with you know our down you know a couple layers layers down or you know direct field guys like how did you do it what did you i want to make sure that we did everything now that we possibly could do and then he's just and it's never it's never crystal clear like there's no more of that just flat out, you know, F you, right. I'm out of here. It's just that slow burn of mm-hmm. you're not getting the job done and I can't pinpoint it. A lot of it is is soft skills are yes. so much more important than I ever thought they would have been. Twenty, They didn't teach me that. They didn't give me that in my toolbox. Yep. And that's one of the reasons I'm passionate about communication is they didn't, nobody gave me these tools. Just go right. figure it out, right? Go to work. So those soft skills are the ones that I find a lot of my guys are struggling with mm-hmm. in communication, talking. You know, you brought up the foreman thing. Uh, that's who do we typically make our foreman? The guy who communicates a little better than the yep. other guy, or at least yep. is will look you in the eyes, right? All right, you're the foreman. <laughs> and I, I did that one time. I was brand new to the company out here in, in Colorado 20 years ago, and I had two guys that and they, they gave me an outage. I was doing an outage at a glass plant and I had to set teams up. I mean, that's what you do, right? As a as, as a general superintendent or for general foreman. And uh, so I'm just pairing up guys based on, you know, looks, you know, or, yeah, yeah. or my first impression, my one second impression. And I paired up these two guys and I did all my talking with this one guy. Well, it turns out that other guy was a general uh, super or general foreman mm-hmm. for the company on these other jobs, but I didn't recognize that in him. 
I just mm-hmm. went to the guy that was more communicative and he ended up not working with the company that much longer. But those, I, I'm looking who's talking, you know, so who can yep. I have a conversation with to know, mm-hmm. all right, we're going to plan some workout. So how important are those skills at the foreman level? Uh, and I think that's why I want to promote communication through all levels. It's only going to help your career. It's going to help you stand out. It's going to help you get to that next level because the ones that don't are the ones that are just going to stay behind and be happy turning, you know, wrenches the rest of their life or, or. Yeah. And that's okay. Like we need that. Right? I mean, you know, I have a Fernando who I interviewed way, way. He was kind of the vision of the, the the that this podcast was founded on hmm. because he he straight told me he's like jesse you always want to make me a lead man and a foreman and i don't want that <laughs> like, well, and he of course in my i had my blinders on, i'm like well don't you want more for yourself and don't you want this and and he was like when i finally like shut my mouth and listened right the other maybe most important part of communication is receiving messages <laughs> yeah um I discovered that he was re- heavily engaged with the nonprofit organization that was doing toy drives and fan drives and food wow. drive, like all kinds of stuff for a low income part of my community. I had no idea he was doing that. And so of course he didn't want to deal with the baggage of work. He had this other really meaningful thing going on in his life. And so I had to back off and say, okay, Fernie, like mm-hmm. I'm going to leave you alone because guess what? He is adding value to our community. And I, I think, you know, for leaders that super ambitious people that, you know, like want to do and discover and grow and all that stuff, that's important. Don't discard the people that don't want that because you don't know the impact that they're having in their community. And they mm-hmm. probably have their priorities. Hell, Oscar Bustamante, OB1, super awesome guy. He's another one that I like. I was always pressuring and pressuring and pressuring him to take a leadership role. He coached his kids' baseball team. He coached the soccer team. I mean, like he did. He amazing husband. He has a classic Chevy pickup. Like he was in the car show. Like he had this whole other grand, beautiful life that leadership role would steal from. Mm-hmm. And so not everybody places the same degree of value on leadership. And we got to honor that. We got to respect that. Um, and it is a beautiful conversation, James. So we'll, let's, let's do the wrap up question. Want to know, man, what footprint do you want to leave? Do you intend to leave on the world? Yeah, and that's the huge. You know, I'd, am I going to, you know, fund a nonprofit that feeds 8 million, you know, 800 million people? Probably not. Okay. But I have that in my mind. Like that, you know, when you ask that, I feel like I should have that. But (laughs) it goes down to one person at a time for me. Mm. And I have really found, again, my groove in helping. Uh, you know, the story time is what my uh, project engineers call it. Oh, it's story time. Um, <laughs> to share the knowledge and the information that I have one yes. person at a time. You know, am I going to stand in front of a of a 10,000, you know, auditorium and, and preach my message of communication? Uh, I, maybe, but I'm right. not going to say no. But that's my goal is still in that room one person at a time. I want to help them help their career, help mm-hmm. them develop themselves. And as I've really have discovered, do what you want to do, which is hard for me to say, because what I want you to do is work for me and (laughs) do the best that you possibly can, but do what you want to do because that's what I'm doing right now. So that's really the the footprint I want to leave. It's probably a small footprint, but it'd be one person at a time. Oh my God. So did not disappoint. Here's the thing is what, this is my observation. When I hear people talk about, you know, they want to, whatever, have a Lamborghini and they, these these types of things. Um, I think that's good. Like, that's not bad, at least, unless they're stealing it, right? Um, <laughs> but, but what you just said is, like, so profound. It, it, it's not. It's one person at a time. It's sharing the experience that you have as a human being on this planet with others to help them discover fulfillment and contentment in their life. And here's the like the super, super deep part here is the most important person is the person in front of us. Mm-hmm. That's and, 
And that person has a lifetime of experience and pain and knowledge that is tremendously valuable to everybody else. And so to share that is the key. All the other grand things, I believe, happen as a result of that, of sharing that. And as you already know, as you start teaching and sharing, you start discovering more about yourself and it, it continues to build. Um, so I am looking forward to sitting in that 10,000 room audience and hearing the inspirational talk you're going to have about communication, James. And this is this did not disappoint knew it was going to be awesome. Did you have fun, James? I had a great time, Jesse. I appreciate you. Last minute, it couldn't have been better. If I had any more time to think about it, it probably would have been uh, <laughs> even worse. So I, no, I had, I've had a great time. It's been a great conversation. Uh, you know, I'm, you're a learner, I'm a learner. And I think those are the people that I want to partner with. And yes. those are the people I want to talk to. Because if you're, there is, part of the part of our podcast is we're going through a book right now never split the difference by chris voss and he's got some very quotable things in there and he he's a very good negotiator but negotiating is listening i heard you say that too uh li communication is listening and this book is really a book about listening how to listening skills asking questions stuff like that but one of the things he says a lot is if you're not getting better you're getting worse mm. And and I I like to use that as much as I can because if you and that's how true is that right your skills of me this is how he's and he doesn't you know he's an FBI uh, former FBI negotiator so it's like this right he's uh, he's Brooklyn uh, FBI agent guy yeah. but it's if you're not getting better you're getting worse so the minute you're not getting better your skills are depleting so you hmm. should be working on yourself getting better every day and this is what uh, these conversations help me get better every day. 10, 4, boom. Let's wrap with that. Damn, dropping the mic. <laughs> that conversation with James was like really motivating and inspiring for me. He dropped some real wisdom. And I love when people talk about the footprint they intend to leave on the world. Uh, they usually kind of say, oh, you know, it's really not that big a deal. And then after they get to talking, it's like, man, it's the biggest deal in the world. Uh, so hit up James. Y'all need to check out his podcast, The Uncommon Communicator. Support him. There's some good stuff out there for you and your people to, to put into practice. And now it's time for the shout out. So we got a, a comment from Demographics. That's the title in the uh, review that, that was left. So Demographics, all respect, my friend. And here we go. Demographics says, I just want to get to the bottom line is that lean tool process is great. And sometimes we just get trade partners, superintendents and foreman's personnel that don't have either a great education or no education or never been exposed to high level, mid-level or any level of pure communication. I'm not saying that we just have dumb people out there at all. I'm saying is we have to understand the audience we're speaking to. I believe you are blessed with the gift to comprehend and communicate. And I think the biggest challenge is to communicate to others that don't. Demographics, I appreciate you taking the time to leave us that comment. And I wanna share this. I'm, I'm going to assume that it's coming from a good place and it's your personal observation of the world. So thank you for having the courage and sharing that. One thing that I had imprinted into my mind is if the learner hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught. So what that means is the onus on communication and getting the message across and transferring the knowledge lies upon me as the teacher. Uh, it's very easy for me to point the finger and say other people don't have the skill set, other people are lacking, etc. But the, the skill that you reference and my ability to communicate came from me really looking back at all the times that I failed to communicate, that I failed to connect and making micro adjustments to improve that. And I did that by asking them specifically, what is it that I'm doing that is not connecting with you? And also, how can I better serve you? Those two questions have helped me tremendously 
And I want to share those with you demographics so that you can um, have a more fun time when you're communicating through all the, the pains and struggles that we have out there on the job site. Again, thank you for leaving the comment. To the rest of the LM family out there, love y'all, and we'll talk again soon. Peace. Man, you are one dedicated listener sticking with us all the way through to the very, very end. Please know that this podcast dies without you. And we invite you to share how the episode's impacting you, along with your thoughts, questions, and suggestions. You've been gracious with your time, so we added social media links in the show notes to make it super easy for you to connect with us. Be kind to yourself, stay cool, and we'll talk at you next time.